In part 6 of this series, we learn that fleshly lusts war against the soul. Walking in the spirit is key to getting rid of fleshly lusts and guarding our soul so that we are emotionally strong, sound and whole. We learn what it means to walk in the spirit. Right, before we uh, make our declaration, if you have, uh, have your Bibles, please, let's turn to Romans, the fourth chapter. Uh, Romans chapter 4, and we just look very briefly at the faith of Abraham. Romans chapter 4, we look at verse 17. The Bible tells us to follow the steps of the faith of Abraham. Whether we are Jew or a Gentile, the Bible says, that's the man whose faith you want to follow. And one of the things that we, of course, there's an entire passage here in Romans 4 that talks about Abraham's faith. But one of the things about how Abraham engaged with God, how Abraham walked with God in his journey of faith, is given to us in verse 17. Remember, it's just one part of it that uh, we are picking up this morning. It says in verse 17 of Romans 4, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So God spoke to Abraham and he said, I have made you a father of many nations. Now at that time, he had no child. But he, God is saying, I have made you. I've already declared you. I've already determined who you are, what your future is going to be. I have made you a father of many nations. But then Abraham had to walk into this. He had a journey into this. And he had to understand something about God, that God calls, God gives life to the dead, and he calls things that do not exist as though they did. So many times when God, God speaks to our lives through his word, or maybe just putting it in your heart, he declares your future. He says, I've made you this. This is your destiny. This is what I've called you to do, called you to become. And many times, that promise that he speaks to us seems impossible. Lord, that's not me. I mean, you found the wrong person. <laughs> that cannot happen in my life. But that's what he did to Abraham. I have made you a father of many nations. And Abraham had to understand something about God. That God gives life to the dead. He makes impossible or impossibilities become possibilities. And he calls things that do not exist as though they did. So God is not looking at your present to decide your future. He calls things into existence that actually do not exist for you and me. Amen? So when he speaks promises like that into your life and my life, that we need to be like Abraham saying, God... I know you're the God who gives life to the dead. You call things that do not exist into existence. I receive it. I'm going to walk with it, walk with you into that future. And Abraham began to call himself what God called him, father of many nations. So you begin to call yourself what God calls you or what God has called you in his word and his promise to you, even if it does not exist immediately at that moment. You begin to call things into existence. Amen? So let's rise to our feet this morning. We are going to declare what God has declared concerning us. Now some of us may say, well, this is not true at the moment. That's okay. We call things that are not as though they were. So put your Bibles high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. 
I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Shake hands once again, please, with the person next to you. Say hello, and you may be seated. God bless you. Are you ready for some good news? Okay. Uh, here's an email that came in earlier this week. I'm not going to mention the names of the people. This was a couple who were part of our church, and then uh, I think last year they, they moved out to another city. Uh, they have a young daughter as well. So three of them, they moved out. Now, unfortunately, uh, when they moved out, their husband, for whatever reason, he abandoned his wife and his daughter, and he went away with another person, another lady. And so she called, the wife called. It was a couple of months back, she called, and, she, you know, just poured out her heart, and we prayed over the phone, just shared a few words, and she called another second time. We did the same thing, just prayed. And here's what happened. This is the husband now sending the email. He says, uh, she was talking about his wife. She was in immense distress because of the way I'd left her. Your prayer gave her hope and strength to regain her composure and carry on with her life. Your fellowship over the phone restored her faith, made her pray to the Lord. Uh, the power of prayer also reached out to me, even though I was in a far off city and living my life as the prodigal son, I suddenly began to miss going to the APC Sunday services and began to reminisce how simple, loving, and awesome my life was while I was at Bangalore with my wife. So much to the extent I decided to return back home and reunite with my family. Upon returning, my, returning home, my wife shared her testimony, how she reached out for prayer. And here's what he says. He says, I owe my life to the Lord for rescuing me from the biggest mistake I would have made in my life. For bringing about a change in my heart and allowing me to get back home safely. I'm grateful for the fellowship uh, and I want to thank you. And, and then he says, this is a miracle in my life that I will testify in my coming days about how the Lord heard the prayer and saved a family uh, that one, once participated here. I will thank the Lord. I'll remember this and, and, and so on. And of course, God is just doing a work of healing in their lives. Amen. Let's just thank the Lord for that. You know, I was so touched when I, when I got this email. Of course, he shares what God is doing to bring in, in just bringing restoration their home and family and all that. But I was so touched that the husband would take their time just to send this email back and say thank you. Uh, and God's just done something in his heart, his life, and God is doing something awesome uh, in that family. Amen? All right. This morning, we are continuing in our series on emotional wholeness and deliverance. And uh, this is the sixth message in this series. There's one more that we'll do the last Sunday of this month, and we will wrap up this series. Uh, what we are trying to address in this series is the fact that God wants each one of us to be emotionally whole. As we saw, and we've been repeating this verse in 3 John, verse 2, John wrote, John wrote, he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, that you be in health, even as your soul prospers. So he wants us to prosper in life. There's nothing wrong. He wants us to be in health. That's a good thing. But notice these two are connected to our soul prosper, even as your soul prospers. And so it's important for us to be in a place where we are emotionally whole, doing well in our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. So being well in our soul. God wants that for us. God desires. And we saw this from Psalm 23 verse 3, where the Bible says, He restores my soul. 
So if, there, if I've got problems in my soul, if I'm hurting, uh, other things that are happening in my soul, I can go to the Lord knowing that He is the restorer of my soul. He can make me whole again. Restore me. And so we are learning, or we've been discovering here, on how we can be emotionally whole and be delivered. In some cases, the problems we are uh, experiencing in our soul have a demonic source. There are evil spirits that cause them. And so we've talked about that and how to get free uh, from those things. And I'll just quickly uh, review these uh, that make and just mention the titles of what we've seen so far in part one. We talked about problems and causes. In part two, we talked about how we receive healing and deliverance. And we also said it's not enough just to say, I receive healing. Because now you've got to journey into wholeness and stay emotionally whole. So that was in part three. We talked about journeying into emotional wholeness. How we must rest in the Father's love, be established in our identity in Christ, and release the past as we make our journey into emotional wholeness. In part four, we talked about staying emotionally whole. Some practices that will help us uh, stay whole. Uh, renouncing lies with the truth of the word, speaking a uh, blessing, canceling curses. Uh, we talked about guarding against negative emotions. And uh, we talked about practicing the power of forgiveness. Last, uh, the Sunday before last, in part five, we talked about the conquest of the mind, how the mind is a battlefield, and we must take every thought captive. Uh, we must renew our mind with the word of God and develop a positive mindset. This morning, in part six of this message, as we're continuing talking about emotional wholeness, I want to address a subject that is not very, very popular. Most people would not like to talk about it. It's called crucifying the flesh. So tell your neighbor, get ready to be crucified. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you listen to preachers or you listen to people talk of the Bible, they talk about it as though this doesn't exist in the Bible. In fact, it is in the New Testament. It is for you and me, born again, spiritual believers, that we must learn to crucify the flesh. Now, when we say the flesh, what, what do we mean? What does the New Testament mean when it uses the word flesh? It's referring to the ungodly or the evil or sinful passions or desires of our body, the physical part of us. So our body has desires. Some of it are good, legitimate, and necessary. And some of it are wrong. They are sinful. They are ungodly. Our body has desires. You want to eat, you want to rest, you want to sleep. It's all good. But then it also has wrong desires, fleshly desires. And that's what the Bible is addressing here uh, when it talks about the flesh. But now how does this connect back to emotional wholeness? I mean, why do we need to ad address or crucify the flesh in order to be emotionally whole, in order to be emotionally well? I want to start with this verse here in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, where the Bible says, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Now remember, he's talking to believers. Saying, hey believer, you love God, you're, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, all that's good. But here's something about living this life. Abstain, stay away from fleshly lusts, from those ungodly desires of our body. Why? Because they war against, they create conflicts, they create trouble, problems in our soul, in our mind, will, and emotions. So he says, you stay away from those fleshly lusts. Now just take one example, and I'm sure we could talk about many. But take one example, if a, if a man or a woman, if a person is addicted to pornography, now, that's a fleshly desire. It's an ungodly desire of the flesh. And he or she is yielding to that. It's not only, gratif not only gratifying the ungodly desire of their flesh, but it's going to cause problems in their mind, will, and 
emotions. All kinds of problems. Things like, oh, I'm not able to concentrate. He walks up to the office. He's sitting there. He's supposed to write some software program. And his mind is thinking of all the things he's been, all the bad things he's been watching. No, con unable to concentrate. Problem with concentration. What's the cause? Hey, fleshly lust. He's not able to look at women properly. What's the problem? Fleshly lust. Pornography. And now his, his view of women is so warped, it's so distorted, it's so evil, it's ungodly. His emotions are affected. What's the cause? Fleshly lust. It's warring against his soul. It's causing problems in the soul, in the mind, the will, the emotions. And that's why we need to talk about this as we uh, address the Holy Show being emotionally whole. It's one thing to receive prayer and say, I, I need he inner healing. I need healing for my emotions and I need deliverance. That's great. That's, a, that's one, of the, one of the things in the process. But remember, you've got to abstain from fleshly lust. Because those war against the soul, they continue causing problems. So, the Bible talks about what I would just title as fruits of the flesh. So the Bible calls it the works of the flesh. Or this is how, uh, you know, you can see the flesh being uh, expressed. So if a believer, he loves Jesus, but if he's living according to the flesh, here's what you would see in his or her life. The fruit that hangs off the tree. These are the things you and I would see. Galatians 5, 19 onwards, it says the works, the acts, the deeds, or the fruits of the flesh are evident. This is what you see. Which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions or divisions, heresies, going off into ever. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revileries, and the like. Meaning this list can go on. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Saying, believers, look, these are the fruits of the flesh. We're living according to the flesh. If you're not abstaining from fleshly desires, these are, what, these are the things that will become evident in your life. People will see these things. Hanging off of you. And it says, you know, practicing such things will prevent us from entering into the kingdom of God. Now, in Scripture, you ve find very often the Bible talking about seeds, roots, trees, and fruits. Very often, our, per the person is compared to a tree, is likened to a tree. And what is, comes off of our life is likened to the fruits that we bear. But we also understand that there are seeds which give rise to the roots, which grow up into the tree, which then bear the fruits in our lives. Now, many of us, we don't have much control, or we didn't have much control in the seeds that were sown into our lives, especially when we were young and when we were growing up. Those things were outside our control. The environment that you grew up in, uh, the way people treated you, uh, some of the experiences that you had to go through, uh, some of them may have been abused or tra traumatic, and, and we didn't have control on these things because other people were involved. So what happened? Bad seeds got sown into our lives. Bad seeds spring up into bad roots, which then grow up into these bad trees that bear bad fruits. Pastor, why are you talking about bad, bad, bad? <laughs> We're dealing with these issues. They bear bad fruits. And now if you want to get rid of the bad fruit, we have a couple of options. We can try to keep cutting the fruit over and over and over and over again. Or a better way is to lay the axe to the roots. We can't do anything about the seeds. They've already been sown and already taken root. 
Of course, as mature people, we can protect our hearts and our lives from any further bad seeds being sown. We can do that as adults. We have responsibility. But for the seeds that have already been sown in our lives and that have probably sprung up and bearing all the wrong kind of fruit and people are wondering why uh, is this wrong kind of fruit showing up in this person's life and we read a list of some of them. We must understand the way to resolve that is to lay the axe to the roots of that tree that's bearing that kind of fruit in our lives. It's not enough to do some self-help thing, just trim off the fruits and make you look pretty. Because it's soon going to show up again. Got to lay the axe to the roots. Now, these roots, these bad roots in our lives, they not only trouble us, but they also trouble people around us. Hebrews chapter 12, we just refer to one verse here. We'll skip a slide. Just go to Hebrews 12. Verses 14 through 17, the writer of Hebrews says, Pursue love with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. So here he's mentioning one particular root. He calls it the root of bitterness. Now he doesn't address what seeds caused this root. There could be all kinds of seeds that gave rise to this root of bitterness. Maybe, you know, somebody close to you betrayed you. And from then on you get, just got bitter with people. He said nobody could be trusted. You got bitter about life. Whatever. Something happened that, that, that caused a bad seed to fall into your heart, your life. And now there's a root of bitterness. And what is what he says? This root of bitterness, if it springs up, it troubles you. It troubles me. And those around me, many others are also defiled. Are you with me? So these roots in our lives... They cause us trouble and they cause trouble to those around us. But here's the good news. When John the Baptist introduced the ministry of Jesus, he did it like this in Matthew chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Now look at this introduction. Matthew 3, 10 to 12, John the Baptist is introducing Jesus to the world. And here's what he says. He says, even now, the axe is laid to the roots of the trees. So Jesus is coming. says, here's somebody who's come. He's going to lay the axe to the roots of the trees. And he continues there. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the tree is referring to the person, the things in our lives that bear bad fruit. Jesus came to lay the axe to the root, take the bad tree that's bearing bad fruit, and burn it in fire. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who comes after me, the Lord Jesus, he's mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Then he goes on to verse 12. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's interesting. In verse 10, 11, 12, he's using the word fire. In verse 10, he's saying the tree that bears bad fruit, the axe will be laid to the root, and that tree will be burnt with fire, completely destroyed. And then in verse 12, he uses another imagery. Now some of us, those of us who have gone out into the villages, we can relate to this. You may have seen uh, on the side of those big farms, they have the threshing floor. They gather all the wheat there, uh, or the wheat, they, get, they thresh the wheat. And then after that, you'll find people with their renewing, whatever, whatever they call it, <laughs> the fan. And they... With the help of the wind, they separate out the wheat so that the chaff falls off onto the ground. Then they gather the wheat 
to one side and they get rid of the chaff. The chaff is the unnecessary part representing the fleshly things of our lives. And so once again, John says, Jesus separates the wheat, the good, from the chaff. And he burns up the chaff with fire. So any guess on what verse 11, the fire in verse 11 is? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. What is that fire going to do? Well, he just told us in verse 10, it's going to burn the bad tree. And then he tells us in verse 12, it's going to burn up the chaff. So part of Jesus' ministry, what he came to do was to lay the axe to the roots of the bad trees in our lives, trees that are bearing bad fruit. And he also came to baptize us in fire that will burn up the bad tree and burn up the chaff in our lives. Tell a neighbor, that's good news. <laughs> Doesn't sound good, but it's good. Because he came to deal with these things in our lives. Amen? And so you and I, we must recognize, identify the bad fruits. Identify the bad tree. Identify the bad roots. And say, Jesus, I need you to lay the axe, the roots in my life. A common or some of the common bad roots probably all of us struggle with, for instance, we have, there is self. We saw selfishness as one of those works of the flesh. Self. There is pride. There is jealousy or envy. There is lust, which is uncontrolled evil desires. These are things that are very common. Bad roots. And so all of us can pray. Say, Lord, I, I recognize this in my life. I want you to lay the axe to the root of it. And I want this fire that will burn up the bad tree, that will burn up the chaff. Amen? This fire is a work of the Holy Spirit. So I want to just expand more on that. The Apostle Paul taught us, both in Galatians chapter 5 and in Romans the 8th chapter. Remember, he's speaking to believers. Those who love Jesus were born of the Spirit. And he says in, in both these passages, in Galatians 5 and Romans 8, he teaches us something very important. He says, if you live in the Spirit, you must also walk in the Spirit. So live in, the, in Galatians 5 and verse 25, he says, if we live in the Spirit, if we have our life in the Spirit of God, if we have that, then what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to walk in the Spirit. Now, it is true. All of us as believers, we have our life in the Spirit. In your inner person, as a born-again believer, your life is from above. You are from another planet. In the spirit, you are an alien. You have your life from the spirit of God. And he says, if we live in the spirit, what must we do? We must walk in the spirit. The word walk is an interesting word there. In the Greek, it, it, it's, it's, it has a military connotation to it. It means to proceed in a row as the soldiers march, to go in order, to keep rank, to keep step, to walk in line with. So he says, you and I must walk in the spirit, meaning keep in step, keep in line, march with the Holy Spirit. Walk in the spirit. If you live in the spirit, you have your life in the spirit, that's great. Now you've got to walk in the Spirit. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit. And what will happen if you and I walk in the Spirit? He tells us in verse 16 of Galatians 5. He says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So here's the answer. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That means I walk 
in union with, yielded to, submitting to the Holy Spirit in my life. And if I walk in step in line, so when he says left, right, left, right, okay, Holy Spirit, left, right, left, right. Attention, yes, sir. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in line with him, in step with him, yielded to him, under his influence, in union with him. Then he says, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then in verse 17 of Galatians 5, he says, you know, the flesh is always going to lust against the spirit. It's a given thing. Meaning, as long as you are on the earth, even if you're 99, you're living in a body, you're going to face this. Your flesh is going to lust. It's going to have desires that are opposite to, contrary to the Spirit of God. But, he says, if we are in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Are you with me so far? So all of us as believers, we, are in, we live in the Spirit, but we can also, we are called to walk in the Spirit. And if we walk in step with the Holy Spirit, we will live, we will overcome the flesh. We keep the flesh out of the way. Keep it submitted. Don't yield to the ungodly desires. And that's why he says there in Galatians 5 and uh, uh, verse 20. Uh, verse 18, he says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, you don't need the law to tell you what's right and wrong. The Holy Spirit's leading you. So if you stay leaded, yielded to the Holy Spirit, walking in line with Him, you don't need the law. You don't need the law to say, thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, because the Holy Spirit is leading you. He is going to help you. Keep your flesh down. And what the law could not do, and that it was powerless, the Holy Spirit empowers the believer to walk in a manner where he is able to keep the law and more. Amen? So walk in the Spirit. Living yield to the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, you empower me. Paul brought it out like this in the 8th chapter of Romans. I look at that passage and as we get ready to close, he says in Romans 8, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So that's clear. If a believer is living according to the flesh, that is not pleasing to God. Verse 9, but he says, but you are not in the flesh. That's not the way you and I as believers live. But we live in the Spirit. Either to the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, because the Spirit of God is indeed dwelling in you. For if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. So now the body is dead. You are no longer yielding or responding to the ungodly desires of the body because the body is dead. It, it desires to sin. As far as you're concerned as a believer, the body is dead. But the Spirit is life. Our life comes from the Spirit. Verse 11, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. Notice he's saying, believers... We don't owe anything to the flesh. You're not a debtor to the flesh. You don't have to say yes to it. In fact, it's dangerous. He says, if we live, he's talking to believers, remember, if we live according to the flesh, we will die. He's talking about spiritual death there. If we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if we by the Spirit, with the help of, of the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of our body, the sinful deeds, we will live. So the Holy Spirit, if we buy the Holy Spirit, meaning with His empowering, 
with the strength he gives, with his presence and power at work in our lives, if we by the Spirit bring an end to the sinful deeds of our body, you're on your way to spiritual life. Both in this world and the world to come. But that's the good news. That as believers, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can put to death the sinful deeds of our body. We can crucify the flesh. And I just want to remind you, why is, this all, why is all of this important? Because walking in the Spirit is the key to get rid of those fleshly lusts and guarding our soul so that we are emotionally strong, sound, and whole. Let's so walk in the Spirit. You abstain from fleshly lusts. You abstain from things that war against your soul. So now, as you walk in the Spirit, you're also emotionally whole. Because you don't have those things warring against you, against the soul. I close with this. In Colossians 2, 6 and 7, Paul writes, he says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Be rooted and built up in Him. That means you have your roots in the person of Jesus Christ. So the tree that's coming out, the fruit that's coming out is what comes out of the, the person of Christ Himself. You're rooted in Jesus and so people begin to see the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control, faith. And he says there's no law against all of these. Nothing holding these things back. They'll begin to come forth in your life as you and I walk in the Spirit. Amen. And that's a beautiful life to live. And people are able to see, wow, how do you have that? Answer, I walk in the Spirit. I walk yielded to the Holy Spirit, in step with Him, aligned with Him, submitted to Him, in union with Him, under His influence. And then they're able to see the beauty of Jesus in you and in me. Amen? Let's remain seated for a few moments. I call our worship team up, please. We'll take a few moments to pray. So this morning, I want us to pray and ask the Lord. Lord, John the Baptist said, the axe is laid to the root. So that every tree that bears bad fruit is taken down and burned up. And I want to ask you, Lord, this morning to lay the axe to the root, bad roots in my life. Don't worry about the seeds. You had no control over it. But identify those roots and say, Lord, lay the axe to the root of this in my life. And then you pray, ask the Holy Spirit, invite the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, burn up the bad tree. Burn up the chaff. I want the fire of the Spirit that burns up the wrong things. Help me to walk in the Spirit. So just like you to take a few moments just to pray right now. It's between you and the Lord. Self, jealousy, pride, lust. It could be something else that, that you recognize in your own life. Just say, Lord, lay the axe to the root of this. Lord Jesus, we invite you this morning 
to lay the axe, the roots, bad roots in our lives. We want these things to be taken out by the roots. And Spirit of God, we invite your presence, the fire of your presence that burns up the bad tree, that burns up the chaff. invite your presence we pray you help each one of us walk in the spirit walk in line with you Holy Spirit be led by you let's just rise to our feet take a few moments just to worship Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are. Father, we just pray your grace on each one of us, empowering us to walk in the Spirit, that we by the Spirit will mortify the sinful deeds of our body, will put an end to the sinful deeds of our body. Holy Spirit, we just pray your empowering right now on everyone here. But by the strength you bring, by the power you bring into our lives, by the fire of your presence, God. The fleshly things that have controlled us for a long time, God, we will see them breaking off of our lives. Because the axe is laid to the root and you burn up the tree. You burn up the child. That fleshly fruits will be taken out of our lives and the fruit of your presence will be seen, God, through our lives. Give you thanks, Father. Give you thanks. Before we close this morning, I just want to give an invitation for anyone here. If you've never received the Lord Jesus into your life, 
You see, the Bible tells us if anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, it becomes a new creation, a new person. Only, Lord, only the Lord Jesus Christ does this for us. It makes us brand new on the inside. The Bible tells us He forgives our sins. He makes us children of God. He brings us into the family of God. Only Jesus does that. Because He died for us on the cross. He was buried. He rose up again. He's alive today. So if you feel in your heart, I want this new life that Jesus can give me. I want my sins forgiven. I want to follow Jesus. If you feel that inside your heart, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer right now. You can pray that with me if you've never done that before. Let's just pray. If you've never done this before and you feel in your heart a prompting right now that you want to do this, just say this with me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, forgive my sins, make me a brand new person, make me a child of God, and help me follow you the rest of my life. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. God bless you. Walk in the Spirit. Have a great Sunday. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.